We live in the age of cities. For the first time in history, more than half of humanity lives in metro areas. In the U.S., it's more than 80%. But not all cities are equal. A relative handful, maybe 50 or 60, are the big apples of the global economy. Their banks and markets finance that economy, and their corporate leaders shape it. Their great universities train the global citizens of the future, and their researchers imagine that future. Global communications radiate from global cities, so does global culture. These cities have the best restaurants, the finest symphonies. They have the most migrants, the most students, the most clout. They're where the action is. They're called global cities, and as I report in my new book, they run the world. Some of these global cities also rule the industrial era, London or New York, for instance. Others, such as Shanghai and Mumbai, are new players on the global scene. Picture this global economy as a constant flow of goods, people, ideas, money, expertise, moving restlessly around the world just as airplanes travel constantly from airport to airport. Some airports are bigger and more central, and we call them hubs. And some cities are hubs, standing astride and commanding this global flow. If global cities monopolize global power, they also stand on the front lines of global problems. Terrorism, climate change, inequality, demographic change, all hit global cities first and hardest. When this happens, these cities often are on their own, without help from Washington or other national capitals. Increasingly, global cities are working together, framing their own foreign policies, both to cope with the problems of a globalizing world and acting jointly to shape that world. What happens in and to these global cities will determine the lives we all lead in the 21st century.